Hi, Francesco. Hello, Sheer. Nice to see you again. Look, we have a guest. Yes, hi, Rebecca. Who knew? <laughs> Welcome, Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi, thank you. Um, we're going to give people maybe another half a minute to trickle in. And uh, Rebecca, I'm really excited to have you today. I'm going to introduce you in just a minute. So in the meantime, for those who are joining us, Welcome to Zooming In, uh, bi our last bi-weekly curatorial conversation for the semester from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at University of California, Berkeley. I'm Shil Gal Kohavi, and joining me is Francesco Spaniolo, our head curator. Um, this is a Zooming webinar, so all our participant, participants' videos cam video cameras are turned off. But you can communicate with us in two ways. You can use the lower bar in your screen and click on the chat uh, button to send us any technical questions or any issues that you're experiencing. Or please do, do use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen as well to ask us any questions that you're going to, that we might have throughout the talk. Um, throughout the past semester, Francesco and I, with, with one or two guests, have been reflecting on exhibitions presented at the Magnus over the last decade, highlighting how they will be revisited in the context of time capsules, a new exhibition opening in the fall. As a reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only one in the world associated with a major research university. Today, we're looking at Piazza Zistanz, Echoes of Judea Facta from Ancient Coins to Modern Art, which was an exhibition we presented in 2018 uh, based on the wonderful research done by Rebecca Lavitan, who's joining us today from Rome. And she'll tell us about, about it in a minute. Rebecca studies the art and architecture of the ancient Mediterranean world. Her research centers around Greek sculpture, um, as well as the reception of classical antiquity in Europe and the United States. She has excavated, drafted, and surveyed in Greece and in Italy. She received her bachelor's degree in art history from Emory University and her master's in letters in ancient history from the University of St. Andrews. She currently holds the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, Emmeline Hill Richardson, pre-doctoral of Rome Prize in the American Academy in Rome, which is where she's joining us from today. Uh, I'll, Rebecca, I'll let you in, tell us a little about your dissertation and the project you're working on right now in a couple of minutes. And let me just add that uh, in some ways, Rebecca did, you know, excavation digging work also at the Magnus, which is really at the center of our conversation today. It was one of your sites of research, but it's so good to have you back with us, Rebecca. Uh, we, we had such a wonderful collaboration a few years ago and um, a little jealous to know you're in Rome, although it seems like you're still on some kind of lockdown over there, right? So it's not as, as Roman, it's not a Roman holiday. Not quite, but it's great to be connecting back with the, the Berkeley community and, and thanks for including me in the conversation. What a pleasure, really. So, um, so the exhibition Piazza as it stands uh, it's actually, and I'm, I'm, this is such a unique opportunity because over the last few weeks, Rebecca, we've been, Francesco and I have been talking about different types of exhibition projects and curatorial projects that were presented at the Magnus. And many of them were created alongside the work of other students and other scholars coming to work with us, coming to research at the Magnus. And here we actually, um, I mean, this was of course led by Francesco and I joined in we created a response to your to your wonderful project and your your Magnus excavation. So why don't you uh, maybe start, if you don't mind, by telling us a little bit about what you're doing right now and take us back to to the project to our project. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll try to do an elevator pitch of my dissertation in <laughs> two minutes or less. Um, okay. So I am an archaeologist and an ancient art historian. I mostly work on Greek sculpture, but a lot of Greek sculpture is actually found in Italy because of the sort of interesting relationship that the Romans had with the ancient Greek world. And my dissertation talks about is discussing one type of ancient Greek sculpture that's known as the Pasquino group. Um, it was made in the second or third century BC, but there were lots of Roman copies of it, including 14 Roman copies that we still have today. And it showed one living warrior carrying the body of, of his dead companion. And, the mo and you can see a restored version of that. That's the first image that's in Florence now in the Loggia di Lanzi. 
Uh, the most famous copy of this looks a lot less complete. It was excavated in Rome in the year 1500. Uh, and that's the, the copy that gives the statue its name. And that one is notable because in the 16th century, it became a place where people would post uh, poems about current events. And it was a way for them to express their dissatisfaction with the papacy in an anonymous way. So uh, the statue became a sort of speaking character that took on the persona of everyone in the neighborhood and it was reanimated by people by the use of these notes. So you can see a, a print from 1550 that shows this in action. And what's sort of special about this so-called speaking statue tradition is that it's, it's still happening. So I went to the Pasquino two days ago and took this photo uh, where Romans are, are writing their wishes, including their wish to be freed from COVID lockdown uh, and their wish for no tourists to arrive in Rome and all sorts of other things. And um, that is a, a tradition that, that people are maintaining. So it, it's an intersection of ancient, uh, classical reception and modern resistance, uh, a place where sort of time compresses on itself, where people are gathering and a monument that, although fragmentary, sort of serves as a, um, as a mascot for the neighborhood and for the people of Rome. So that's what I, I'm writing my dissertation about. And although it seems like this big stone statue has very little to do with the collection of the Magnus, it actually, these themes of replication, seriality, the fact that there are many copies of this statue uh, and that they all represent the same thing but are used in different ways, that relates to what we'll talk about tonight. And also the idea of uh, images of resistance and how they can be different than what you expect or um, represent different things than, than what you might expect, but still be activated by their users. That also relates to the, the material that, that we'll talk about tonight. Um, would yeah. you like me to talk a little bit about the, the research at the Magnus? Please. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and, and let, me just, let me just preface by saying that you sort of volunteer to tackle the, the <laughs> collection of ancient, and as we found out also, modern replica coins replicas of ancient coins. And it, it was a fantastic contribution to our knowledge of the collection. So even before the exhibition was conceived, the work that you were doing was really uh, highly valuable and a template of the kind of work we're doing at the Magnus at UC Berkeley. So uh, bringing museum collections close to students and vice versa. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Well. Okay, so I'll also try to, to do this quickly and then, and then hopefully you guys can fill in the gaps. Um, I was very lucky to meet Francesco, I think in 2017 on a tour that was showcasing different research happening at different museums and centers at Berkeley. And he had mentioned that there were a number of ancient coins that hadn't been comprehensively studied at the Magnus. And um, some of these might include uh, what we call like Jewish resistance coinage. And I was very interested in that and they were, the folks at the Magnus were generous enough to let me take a look at these coins. And what's super interesting is that in addition to ancient coins that have come into the collection, there were also this series of, of replicas, which themselves are, are kind of imitating the practice of making ancient coins because... Actually, before we move to the replicas, yeah. sure, do you mind going back to the to the slide? With the, the, the first slide is actually is not replicas. These are ancient coins. These are the these are actual ancient coins. Yeah. And so, can you tell us a bit what what does one learn about uh, through sure. through these ancient coins? They're they're you know these are magnified uh, images. They're very tiny. Uh, there is a lot of magnification that goes on. But what what can one derive by by studying? Right. These? So yeah, so these are very small bronze coins that are probably smaller than your pinky nail, um, but they're still loaded with information and coins are super helpful for archeologists for a number of reasons. Uh, but one of them is that they tend to say the, the organization or the government that minted them, they really have to have an image that carries a lot of meaning because you have such a small amount of space. So the image tends to be quite uh, representative of the values of the people minting the coin. And then the denomination and the material show you the levels of control and, and how regulated the creation of coinage was. So just like how we carry coins in our pockets today that show perhaps presidents or other rulers, many ancient coins had uh, representations of rulers on them and 
coins from the area of Judea or ancient Syria, Palestine are sort of different in that they, they usually had more uh, object-based imagery featuring things like pomegranates, wheat, vessels, things that we still see as, as a major part of Jewish iconography today. So uh, these coins that we're showing here are just two small um, bronze coins, the sort of thing that you would buy bread with. They weren't worth a huge amount of money, but they were important in terms of signifying that show uh, wheat on the, on the left and then an amphora vessel for carrying oil or other, other liquids, wine on the right, um, and that have inscriptions on them that say the date in relationship to the, the whoever was in power at the time. Uh, so these are, these are helpful in that they, they, t they tell us what was important to the people making them and also how they defined um, where they were and what time period they were living in. Additional question, Rebecca. So mm. one, one of the coins is, is a Roman coin. The other one is the coin of the revolt. Who was minting? Where, 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 this is a time, and of, unfortunately nothing new considering the, the horrible news cycle these days from, from the Middle East and from Israel and Palestine. But it was a time of great strife in ancient Palestine when the coins that you were studying were, were minted. Right. And, and who, who, who were the agents there? And, and, and what did they mean for, for people who were in, in, engaged in a resistance against the, the Roman Empire to mint their own coins? Yeah, so this, this is an interesting question because every ancient coin was made by a person who had to physically hammer the little piece of metal themselves. And um, so there would be one person who was creating the, the coin and one person who owned the die, the stamp that was used to make the design. And sometimes those people were part of the same organization and sometimes they weren't. In the case of the first coin, the people in charge of minting were client kings. So they were local Jewish kings, but who were subservient to Rome. But you can see that these coins are called pruta, that's the denomination, and that signifies how much they're worth. And that's not a Roman denomination, it's a local one. So it's not based on the denarius or other Roman coin system. So these are sort of a, these are emblematic of the time they were made in that this part of the world was simultaneously under the influence of Rome, but not totally subjugated by it yet. Um, and then we'll see later that that, that changes uh, with a sort of announcement by Rome that indeed this province was under their dominion and they announced this by issuing coins themselves. And these coins also show that this was a real area of mixture and um, multiculturalism in that the inscriptions are sometimes in local script, sometimes in Greek. So we see all sorts of different influence that, uh, that these little tiny pieces of evidence give us about, about the multiculturalism of the area. But one way that the people sort of stood up, stood up to power and resisted power was minting their own coinage because in the ancient world, the coin was worth its weight in the material that it was made out of. So if you could subvert, if you could make your own bronze or silver coins, they would still be worth their weight. And that was a way to work outside of uh, outsider control because you could control your own economy and uh, not be subject to artificial inflation or um, other ways that empires like Rome could, could control the provinces. Fascinating. And many of these coins enter collections like the Magnus because of the archeological craze, right, Shear, the archeological craze that, uh, that hit Israel, especially after the 1967 Six Day War, right? It was a time in which there was uh, the ability to access sites and, and create essentially established archaeological sites that had not been established previously. And it was like almost like a national, everybody in, national everybody in Israel became, became a, a, a self-appointed archaeologist, right? From, from heads of state to, to anyone. And, and I remember living in Jerusalem, I, I, one of my neighbors is, is one of the leading dealers in, in antiquity when I lived there. And, and, and I remember people coming over with just so pouches full of coins. So they're, 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 they're not super rare and they're incredibly emblematic, right? And, uh, and um, among other things, you know, as a modernist, I'm always in awe about how modern late antiquity feels, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a time in history in which it seems like everything, every anxiety explodes and, and, 
and so on. And so these coins also represent a lot of those ancient anxieties. And as you were saying, Rebecca, modes of, of resistance to power and, and, and where do Jews stand vis-a-vis the -vis Roman Empire? Are they a minority? What kind of minority? What kind of status they have? So it, it's a long story, right? Long and complicated. Mm -hmm. Complicated by replicas as well, like these ones. What what what, did, what was your reaction when you realized there were also replicas in the collection? Were you disappointed? It seems like the way you're studying Pasquino, it seems that you are you you're pretty good at uh, at uh, the balancing act of late antiquity and and modernity, right? That going back and forth in the chronological lines. Yeah, I think um, I, in a, a very traditional study of coins. Um, uh, the researcher might be disappointed to find replicas because it means that that not everything is, is coming from an ancient context. But I actually think that the presence of these coins is really fascinating because it shows that in addition to uh, those coins that people were buying from dealers or collecting themselves during the archaeological craze in Israel, people were also um, buying these sets that were pre-assembled to kind of form a message about what ancient Judea was and, uh, and that those were sort of treasured or interesting objects for, for visitors as well. And it's a, it's a mode of narration and, and mythology creation. And also that these coins send two different, the coins that were sold as replicas sent two very different messages. Some of them were Jewish resistance coinage that, as I mentioned, um, was meant to subvert Roman control. And then some, like the one shown here that was issued, it's a replica of a coin issued by Vespasian. These weren't meant for people in Judea to see. They were meant for his world, the greater Roman empire. It was an announcement that that part of the provinces had been um, come fully under his control. And so, the fact that those images then also circulated in the region and, and people were sort of forced to use this coinage and then that we're replicating them now, it, it tells a much bigger story. So I was very happy, just as in my work with sculpture, to be able to kind of think about these replicas as, as objects in and of themselves rather than, than substitutes for, for something real. They're just as, as real. They also signal the fact that the, and especially these types of replicas we just looked at, that, uh, that uh, um, the echoes of the revolts of the, uh, of the early part of the first millennium uh, continue to this day. And that was in a way uh, an inspiration to construct an exhibition and Shira and I co-curated with you around your research. The exhibition was centered on a, on a long, chronological display of coins that gave a timeline and explained the history of the revolts and essentially of the end of Jewish self-government in, in Palestine and the beginning of an era in which diaspora was the only option for, for Jews and their communities around the, around the world. So it's a very pivotal time. And we, we decided together to kind of mine the collection and then explore it and create a series of curatorial responses around these concepts that you were bringing forth in, in your research. So the posters that we mined, you know, they're amazing posters from Israel and the Magnus collection. And then sure, we, we were just inspired, even I mean, aside from, from, from the iconography of Bar Kokhba, but even just the, the shape of the medallion. And we had just received the uh, the, 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 Arthur, the Sobe family Arthur Schick collection uh, around that time, we were starting to explore it, catalog it and document it. So these were really our first forays. We've devoted other presentations to Arthur Schick, but these were our first forays right here about, about Arthur Schick. What, what happens in, in, in the images we're seeing now? Yeah, and we'll, well, we'll discuss Arthur Schick briefly a little bit later on, but here we really selected these, um, not only because as you said, Francesco, that Baal Kuchba story resonates uh, with, of course, with your research, Rebecca, and for that period, but also because of these roundels uh, that she created for the Book of Esther. Um, and we'll also discuss this momentarily because, of course, the story of the Book of Esther and the celebration of Purim is one of those ritual celebration of, of violence um, and uh, against non-Jewish um, regimes and non-Jewish rulers, um, and we'll, we'll get back to that momentarily. But before we do, here's a, show, a, little, a little showcase of what, what, the, what the exhibition looks like. 
Yeah, these are the display cases in the Hellman Gallery at the Magnus. And, and uh, yeah, we see how the coins were really central to, to the narrative that we developed. And then we kind of diverged. We went in, in, different, uh, in different directions, exploring mining the collection. And, and with the, the, the idea, the rubric in mind of thinking, how does a minority deal with power and powerlessness, right? And how, how can uh, ideas or even actions of revolt or resistance or even outright violence and, and sometimes revenge against oppression can be expressed by, by, uh, by groups of people that have their agency somewhat reduced by their minority status and diasporic status. So that was really the, the topic of the exhibition. And we started with no, no, none else than, than Marc Chagall. Chagall. Right here. Yeah, and Marc Chagall created, these are uh, three works that were selected by us from a series of, uh, of Hebrew Bible paintings that Marc Chagall created during the 1930s. Um, and and the, the, the paintings really uh, devoted to to highlight mighty biblical figures such as, you know, iconic figures as Moses, as Elijah, as King David, and Saul, etc. And here you see the three depictions of um, of uh, of Joshua uh, from from the conquest of the land of Canaan from the book of Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. But when we think about this and we look back at, and think of the artist Marc Chagall and of the period of time that he was creating these. Chagall is a very important Jewish artist. He, throughout his life, he was not only very prolific, but he was really seen as, a, as an identified, as an important and a key artistic member of the Jewish community. And his works not, depict not only biblical uh, stories, but of course, a lot of historical Jewish life uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, and here he was creating these, um, this almost, it almost seems as a possible response of his own to a time when, uh, while Europe was really falling prey to fascist regimes, while the Nazi re regime was on the rise, and he was creating this again between 1930 to 1939, when he was living in Paris. So a very interesting period of time to start to think about these, these characters. But that was just the beginning, of course, of the exhibition, mm -hmm. and we went back and forth between all these elements and stories and rituals. Um, Francesco, would you like to Yeah, so, so we, we, we devoted a section of the exhibition, what, what we called Reckless Rights. And this is after uh, the work of a, of a very, an historian, uh, uh, the late Heliot Orwitz, who, 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 who studied uh, the expression of, the ritual expressions of violence in, in, in the synagogue. And Purim is, of course, at the center of that, as uh, Sherry were saying. Uh, here is an illustration. We've discussed this in a different context uh, some, some weeks ago, uh, the print on the right, but an illustration of how the name of the evil character who threatens Jews in the story of Esther with, uh, with destruction, with, uh, with, um, um, with essentially genocide, is a genocidal project. Uh, the, the, the name and the, the legacy of the, of the evil character in the story of Esther is stomped out and, and in this case even hammered out with Rock so that when the name is pronounced in the story, it cannot be cannot be heard. And this 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 act is inherently an act of not just of sound making, but it's an act of violence and an act of resistance in, of sorts, at least in the context of what we were researching, um, uh, resisting against oppression. Um, and the the recklessness of Purim, the fact it's a it's a festival in which everything has to be upside down, including uh, power dynamics, is very important. But it's by far not the only ritual that. Uh, that uh, has not the only Jewish rituals that con has connotations with violence. A, a primary one, again, something we explored some, some months ago, Shia together, you and I, is, is the role of Judith in the narrative of Hanukkah. Judith is often included, especially in the early modern period, less in the modern period, on, on Hanukkah lamps. It's, uh, it's a, a, a violent female character that slaughters an enemy and uh, all the iconography includes a sword and, and, a, and a severed head. So the, the, the depiction is valid, it's pretty, it's pretty evident. What struck us is the fact, as we see on the left of the image, is that this story is very much connected with the representation of Hanukkah that later on will also incorporate the, the Maccabees and, and yeah. sort of muscular guys, here they are, uh, in, in, in the narrative, in the yeah. visual narrative. Yeah. 
Um, and there is, of course, also the yearning, the yearning to either of, uh, to re of redemption, of course, or to retribution. Mm -hmm. And another way in which violence is expressed in, in ritual is by uh, quoting texts that evoke it. And what, one, one thing that always fascinated me is that the ubiquitous uh, nature of Psalm 137, uh, the one that you know uh, in, begins with the famous words also made famous by, by popular music by the rivers of Babylon. And that uh, reminds, the, reminds those that forgetting Jerusalem is like forgetting one's right hand. Uh, what's less known is the, the ending verse of the, of the text of the psalm. But in a way, even when it's not quoted, it's implicit, right? Biblical texts are often referred to, but we have to look at their, their whole intertext and not just at the words that are quoted. And, the, and, the, and Psalm 137 ends with a very striking words, fair Babylon, you predator, a blessing on him who repays you in kind what have you inflicted on us? A blessing on him who seizes your babies and dashes them against the rocks. And um, it's, these are very, very strong and, and words full of violence that inform uh, uh, synagogue rituals uh, practice often in, in, in times of, of, of powerlessness. So they, they, the idea was here to really investigate the role of ritual as a, as a form of imagined violence, imagined resistance, imagined um, uh, agency. And here is another example. Sure. And we, we, which we also discussed, we're so lucky to have, to have had opportunities to talk really in depth about a lot of these objects. Uh, this is the painting by Lazar Creston, which was created in 1905 as a response to the pogroms of uh, either Gomo, the Gomo community, or uh, Kishina, the famous Kishina pogrom of 1903. Um, and this was, of course, one of the starters of uh, a long-lasting political response of Jewish communities, of Eastern Jewish communities. It also led them to, to join uh, the Soviet uh, revolution later on. And here, we, we since yeah. we only have a few minutes, we really want to show you a snippet. That's yeah, I, I dug out this video that I had made when I was staging all of these uh, documents. We're going to see them uh, these are all documents that were on display and it's, it's part of the holdings of the Magnus. It's essentially um, un, unions, uh, socialist, communist literature, Jewish literature from Eastern Europe, uh, early 20th century, around the time of the resistance against pogroms, the, re, the, the response against pogroms. And, and um, it was, it was a, a set of documents that accompanied uh, the display of the painting we just saw, along, for example, then, then with uh, these books. These was, this were printed in, in their Yiddish books, printed in America, but it's, it's, uh, it's Yiddish communist literature from the, from the uh, early 20th century in the United States. So all of these different elements were part of, of the exhibition, an exhibition that we tried to, to create to really show how uh, a collection like the Magnus can be mined in all sorts of directions and also really keep in mind that antiquity, biblical, post-biblical memory, and the present are always so tightly interconnected, as I was saying earlier, unfortunately, sometimes we are reminded by the news cycle. Um, and um, we displayed in this exhibition and sure curated uh, specifically that, that section, uh, the, 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 it was the first display of uh, artwork by Arthur Schick, that's part of the Toby family Arthur Schick collection in the Magnus. So here are a couple of examples, one aptly called Samson in the ghetto. This is the Warsaw Ghetto, 1943. Yeah, which connects us once again between, uh, from, the, from what was Schick's uh, present, of course, of World War II and the Holocaust taking place in Europe to, to the biblical figure of Samson and the whole idea of self-sacrifice and courage. And here again, another work by Schick, um, which is a triptych that really depicts three major um, the moments of devastation of the Jewish community in the center the devastation of the first uh, temple in Jerusalem by the Romans. And you see and later, you, of course, you're probably familiar with the depictions of Titus of the Ark. And here we have on, your, on the left, um, the, uh, the Spanish Inquisition. And the auto da fe is that accompany. Again, it's sort of a line of continuity, both of persecution, resistance, and uh, responses to, in a way, that the triptych itself is an act of. Of, of resistance, resistance and, and and Rebecca really 
uh, in a way, your research uh, and, and the work that we did for this exhibition, as we do every day at the Magnus, uh, resonate with one another. It's uh, entirely plausible to put together um, Polish-American artist <laughs> Artur Schick, uh, repl coined replicas from, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Israel, modern Israel, uh, but uh, going back to the revolts in, 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 in late antiquity. And even sheet music of an operetta, Yiddish operetta, uh, by the founder of, of Yiddish theater, modern Yiddish theater, Abraham Goldfaden. Uh, we even could rely on, on YouTube. So we're gonna have a little snippet as a way to kind of close this conversation, a little snippet of the sounds of the, of the operetta itself. Let's see if we can, we can play. And I want to invite our audience while you're listening to, to the snippet to please ask us any questions that you may have. Yes, we're gonna devote a few more times to that. <laughs> There you go. So <laughs> even on the on the Yiddish theater stage, uh, Bar Kochba resonates in 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 modern times, uh, sort of like your Pasquino on the notes on it, uh, right, uh, Rebecca? Yeah, of course. Uh, we, we do have more than a question. We have a comment, and I think it's very much for you, uh, Rebecca, but uh, I, uh, somebody's writing, I think most casual museum goers skip over the coinage displays at the Capit Capitol and Museums, in Musei Capitolini a Roma, oh, okay. and elsewhere, when those are where the historical details come alive. Thanks for trying to entice and connect coinage study to the larger project of communicating history. So a, 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 a nice... Uh, comment and, and, and confirmation of, of hopefully the work we've been trying to do together. And uh, how do you see this going? Uh, how, how is the research going these days? It's not, not easy, right, to do field work. No, Rebecca. not at all. But uh, I wanted to say thank you for that comment question. Um, I really appreciate uh, that sentiment because it's true that coins, they simultaneously, when you see a coin in a museum, you're it feels familiar. So you might feel like you don't need to go up and read the text because you know how coins work because we still use them. But it also can seem so obscure and foreign if, if you're not able to read the inscription or you don't recognize the imagery. And that can also be something that, that prevents us from engaging with those. So uh, if we can give people the tools to, to interact with coinage, I totally agree with the person who, who wrote that comment that they're a great way to to communicate history. And I hope that, um, yeah, that we can continue to study both coins and other ancient objects, including sculpture, and that, you know, things continue to safely open and, and it's possible for people to connect again in museum settings and archival settings. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what makes the work meaningful. Absolutely. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's evening, your time. <laughs> It's, uh, it's 30 minutes past noon, 34 minutes past noon, our time. It's our last Zoom webinar, Zooming in webinar for this semester. And, uh, you know, plans for, for the fall are, of course, in the works, but still coming together. So we'll let us know. Uh, we'll let you know. But in, 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 in the meantime, you can continue to follow us. Every single one of these conversations, it's archived on YouTube, on the Magnus website. You can reach us by email. You have all of the contact information here. And we also want to thank Ross yeah. Coulter, who, if you want to, Ross, I know you're there. We know you're there. But if you want to show yourself on, on video, this is the last time that uh, Ross Coulter, who's an undergraduate student at UC Berkeley, is, uh, is powering behind the scenes our, our Zoom conversation. So thank you so much for being with us uh, throughout the semester. And it's really the end of the semester for you, right, Ross? Uh, moving out of Berkeley and... and uh, and almost graduating, correct? Yep, just <laughs> finally finishing my time here in Berkeley. We're so grateful to you for everything you brought to our, our conversations. And thank you again, Rebecca. And thank you to all the you know tens of people that keep following us every week. We'll be back. We're yeah. not going very far.
Thank so, you. and again, follow us, social media, website, YouTube, you, you name it, where they are everywhere. Instagram as well, right? Uh, all of these uh, videos are also archived on Instagram. So there is a way to catch it. And uh, Rebecca, we can't wait to also have you back to, in Berkeley at some point. So, yeah, I can't wait till I'm everything. back there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely weekend and you know, be quiet and safe. Bye. Everybody be safe and well. Goodbye. Bye.